One works wonders. The state of Rhode Island. Woo! Woo! <laughs> Good morning, so honored to be here with you this morning. I'm Lisa Gallette with Foster Forward, and I'm gonna kick things off. So nationally, 5.5 million young people lack connections to either school or work, with our nation's 400,000 foster youth most in danger of falling behind. Young adults who aren't in school and aren't working are costing taxpayers $93 billion annually and 1.6 trillion over their lifetimes in lost revenue and increased social services. And most government-funded workforce development initiatives are calibrated for an adult workforce. The programs that are geared towards youth assume a level of parental engagement and support that is often lacking for those in our foster youth population. For Isaac, a young man aging out of foster care without support of adult connections, it meant not having a sense of purpose or direction, no plan for his future, and daily struggles with housing and other basic needs. Works Wonders is a unique and innovative public-private response to this need. Since inception, Works Wonders has been a multi-level government innovation with partners including the Federal Children's Bureau, Rhode Island's Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and Department of Labor and Training, Foster Forward, our state's youth board called The Voice, and Columbia University and Rhode Island College. It started with a $2 million federal grant in 2010 for a research study and kicked off five years of building and testing an effective model for workforce development that was specifically for and co-created with foster youth. My name's Heather Hudson. I'm the executive director of the Governor's Workforce Board in Rhode Island, and we invest in started this program. Um, Several years ago, Rhode Island was one of the hardest hit states with the recession. We had an unemployment rate of high around 12%. We're now around three. Um, but that was because of our strong political leadership from Governor Gina Raimondo, who said from day one, we need people to get jobs. And she didn't mean just the average Rhode Islander, she meant everybody. That includes our foster forward popu foster youth population. So we started Real Jobs Rhode Island, an industry sector-based partnership bringing in manufacturing, the marine trades, construction, the defense industry, the tech industry. And we started that, but then we realized our foster youth, our homeless youth, um, all these other folks were getting left behind. We created real pathways and we started supporting Foster Forward to specifically target our foster youth population, which now I'm so excited that is getting connected, like Isaac with the manufacturing industry. Um, and the construction industry so that it's not just what we used to have was a train and pray and we're gonna train you and then we're gonna hope that you get a job, good luck. Didn't work so well. So um, I'm gonna hand it back to Lisa. <laughs> so our public-private partnership with the Governor's Workforce Board together with the really unique approach and design of Works Wonders enables us to effectively, effectively bridge the gap and successfully engage and connect the underserved population of foster youth. We credit the fact that foster youth were involved in every aspect of our program design and delivery, and they helped us on the front end identify those key barriers that might otherwise be impediments to their successful participation. Um, we knew that the biggest predictor of future employment is past experience, and our five-step model was designed to help foster youth build the relational competencies and agency that they need to start climbing their career ladder. And it worked. The research study showed that Works Wonders participants experienced a 37% increase in employment, and we had an 83% completion rate. So because of the successes, we doubled our investment with Foster Forward. We are now funding them at $400,000. We started at $100,000, and we've seen an 80% success rate with this partnership specifically. Now we're excited about connecting these youth with apprenticeship models. We just won a $6 million federal grant that we want to connect our foster youth with. Um, in Rhode Island, we have the ability to scale. We uh, got computer science into every single school um, in the past year. So we're excited about helping every single foster youth not just get a support service, not just get a training program, but actually increase their wages, get them onto a career path, get them an education. So it's not just a one and done. Um, and the second thing that I'll add is that we include the foster youth folks and the governor's workforce board statewide career pathways effort 
to include them at the table when we're working with the Department of Education to say, what are you doing, Department of Education, to make sure these kids aren't dropping out of high school? What are you doing, post-secondary education, to make sure they're getting those college degrees? Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right, turn the no no, you guys are great. great last word. <laughs> Certain level of enthusiasm. Yes, I, I got that. Um, so how did you, how, I have to say, um, very seldom have I heard about successful foster no. care programs. It's, it's very, very difficult, I've found, over the years to run. So I congratulate you for focusing on that sector and doing a good job. How did you get to that 83% rate? You know, we um, really engage young people directly in the conversations that affect their lives. And it starts by following through with promises delivered. You know, but if we you say- engage them, is it one-on-one -on -one or is it in groups or- Both, what? I mean, we're, you know, we go out, we have a contract with the state, so we're going out to see every young person in foster care when they turn 16. And we're doing a holistic youth assessment and then we're engaging them and we're giving them opportunities throughout our programs to build assets, save, match. I mean, we're helping them solve problems and we built in flexible funds into the model so that we could be responsive to their needs. We show them that respect and in turn, they're engaged. So you start they're when engaged. you're 16 years old. So they're still in foster care. And you say, now you've got to think about what's going to happen when you turn 18. Do you have a job? Do you have a plan? Mm -hmm. That's, and do other pl places start when they're 16 or is that unique? I think that other states do workforce development. I think the challenge has been it's historically funded through a Department of Labor and Training and the onus is on the young people to get to the front door of a different system. We've bridged the gap to say, we're gonna bring workforce development specifically to this population. The other thing is that nationally recognized programs like Year Up, who have had great success, they have minimum standards. You know, we start with no literacy, no numeracy requirements for these young people. We're truly meeting them where they're at. And we're closing race equity gaps because we're serving the most disconnected young people who often are disproportionately represented in foster care and underrepresented in the results that we want to see. So uh, just um, right underneath uh, Kathleen's question, I want to take you back to what drove you to do this in the first place? I mean, it, again, this is just often a population that either A, most people don't pay that much attention to, B, to the extent that they do, it, we have a system, we have a program, it just runs, it is what it is. I think you that's- You all have yeah. attacked this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's the beauty of public-private partnership. Foster Forward's an agency whose mission is to empower lives impacted by foster care. Our historical challenge was providing workforce development and onboarding 16-year-olds uh, to work, and the existing system didn't work. So we forged a different path together with Heather and the Governor's Workforce Board and the innovations from the state. Now employers get workforce incentives to hire and retain young people, so there's, there's benefit on that end. Um, and we've been able to benefit through the investment of job development funds, which are flexible payroll, ta payroll tax dollars um, that are a lot more flexible than the traditional funding streams of WIOA um, in being able to meet young people where they're at. So it, it's truly this dynamic partnership that's enabled us to do this. So you've had a little time. Have you been able to track high school graduation, college degree acceptance, or employment, or certificate programs, et cetera, et cetera. Again, always concerned about great start. What happens you know, on the back end? Absolutely. Do you want to share a couple of those statistics just in terms of the post-study? Yeah. Um, well, I, so in Rhode Island at age 19, 70% of youth in foster care report being without a job. Now we have cut it in half. So it, we went down from 33%, we cut that down in half. So we know, that, we know that it's working with the groups that we've been working with. The other thing that the Governor's Workforce Board is doing is investing in a P20 workforce dashboard that we will then be able to track our investments in students that have been impacted through Foster Forward and the Works Wonders program and track exactly, as you said, high school rate, 
college and college enrollment, their wages over time. So we have the ability to connect and bring all those partners together, not only on the day to day and on the programs and the investments, but on the data side, we're leading the way to connect and hold ourselves accountable as well on that. And also just to your question about um, education, we are finding that a good number of the young people we're serving are coming to us without a diploma or a GED. And we've brought the GED classes on site um, to provide that. Mine came from Kathleen. Last two questions. Because oftentimes, really fascinating ideas have this underlying nugget of just simplicity. And you try to say, of course, this should, this should work. Uh, what, um, what are the sorts of uh, roadblocks that prohibited something like this from being implemented before? Uh, this is really a, a, a rep replicability question, uh, you, know, you know, why aren't, why isn't everyone doing a public-private partnership like this with this uh, population? I think one of the historic barriers I referenced, the WIOA dollars, we were dealing with a population that was so disconnected that it was very hard for us to plug into those dollars and serve them in the short period of time that we would have to achieve a, male, a major milestone like high school graduation. So the plug-in of the job development funds, you know, it's costing us $2,000 annually to serve a young person in this program, and yet the savings based on the numbers I referenced in the beginning are over $17,000 a year for each disconnected youth. And we believe that this model has incredible promise for the larger population of disconnected youth in this country because the, the population we're serving is really most deeply impacted by trauma. When you think about social determinants of health and ACEs scores, um, if we can be successful with this group, we're very confident that we could be successful with all young people. Can I add one more thing to respond to that? Which, from our perspective, the state and workforce. First, the innovation was industry sector partnerships. As we heard earlier, employers, here, have a foster youth. We'll pay you. No, I'm good, thanks. Not because they're mean, but because like these kids need a lot of help. So we started with employers and industry, and then the realization was, okay, well, now we need support services for these kids. Who knows them? Where are these kids going? Well, they're not going to the federally funded WIOA program. Like They're going to Lisa because she's nice and they trust her <laughs> and her staff. Like They go into their house. It really is a house, a nonprofit. And like they go talk to them, and they help them, and they listen to them, and they talk to them. That's the basic starting point. And then we have our industry sector partnerships and the manufacturers and the marine trades. And I go talk to them, and I say, hey, Wendy Mackey, I know that your boat builders don't require a lot of education. Would you guys mind talking with Lisa and see if there could be a good fit with foster youth? And we just did this with the Nursery Landscape Association. They were like, oh my gosh, this is great. So those connections have to start at the top. They have to start at the top, and they work their way down, and you empower the community through it. And I think with our flexible dollars, not only are we giving Lisa and her team the ability to pay for, oh, I don't know, like a speeding ticket or like rent, because those things happen. Yeah. And trust me, I'm fighting all the time with our business affairs people on that. But we call it a stipend because, look, it's not illegal to pay for those wraparound support services. There's nothing wrong about that. It's a one-time thing. It's very similar to the bail thing that I heard earlier. That's so innovative. We're trying to do that with our dollars at a statewide level. Um, you have a very good provider. Yeah. Um, do you have a requirement to procure this service? How, how, do you, do. how are you doing that? It's a great question. So we did an RFP both for the Real Jobs Rhode Island Partnership and for the Real Pathways Partnership. We did an RFP solicitation, and it's partnership-based. So if you're in a Real Pathways partnership, you still have to have employer and or industry at the table. Can't just be you, nonprofit over there, trying to do a good job. It's where will these people get jobs? What are you training them for? Um, on the Real Jobs partners, it's more led by employers and industry sector, oftentimes with a community college or a career and technical education program at the table or a nonprofit at the table. But we did compete. They won. Um, they'll have to compete again in a few years. So they have to keep up their 85% rate or get higher. Have you considered uh, pay for performance or pay for? 
Um, the state of Rhode Island has actually worked, I believe, with Harvard Kennedy School on this. So um, I don't think we've gotten it off the ground. Um, we've thought about it and talked about it. It's not out the window, but so far this is working. So we're excited about the model that we've set up on the industry sector side and the pathway side to work together. Well, I have to say, um, I think you guys did a great presentation. And I have to say, and hearing about doing a good job for foster care kids is so encouraging. I want to congratulate you. Thank you very much.